Um, good morning, participating in today's global seminar. This is the 30th seminar in the series since it started last year. We would like to acknowledge, celebrate, and pay our respects to the Ngannou and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. My name is Nuke, I will be chairing today's session and I'm hosting this seminar together with Dr. Arianto Patundro and Ms. Ruth Nikki Julu. The seminar is made possible with the supports of the Australian National University and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. In uh, today's seminar, we will discuss how fintech, social and startup entrepreneurs navigate the so-called new normal. And we are very honored to have three pioneering leaders in the, jo in the industry joining us today. Our first speaker, Dr. Amiruddin is a professional banker who has a doctorate in business administration from the University of Western Australia. He has a long established career in many prominent global companies such as Deutsche Bank, Nomura Singapore, and Mitsumitomo Mitsui Bank. Dr. Amiruddin is also known as a patron of humanitarian. Maybe he could talk a little bit later about the floating hospital that he has, that has helped many during the Indonesian earthquakes. His dream is to make ways to support individuals and small medium enterprises to grow. And this dream eventually becomes Investry. And I'm also very excited to introduce our second speaker, Ibu Sara Dewanto from Duit HP. Sara was my classmate from the School of Economics Universitas Indonesia many, many years ago. Sara holds a Master of Business Administration degree from SUNY Buffalo. Prior to founding Duit HP, Sara was a treasury manager at ExxonMobil Indonesia and then she became the chief financial officer uh, at the Millennium Challenge account in, in Indonesia. This is an organization created as part of a 600 million grant from the US government to reduce poverty and to invest in community health. And our third speaker, Mr. Leonardo Camilius, was a valedictorian from the Faculty of Economics, Universitas Indonesia. Prior to setting up Kopasi Indonesia, Leon worked at McKinsey & Co as business analyst. After he volunteered during the Padang earthquake, Leon quit McKinsey & Co as a calling inside him to serve others grew. He started Koprasi Kasih with only 50 million rupiah, or well, that's about 5,000 Australian dollars. And uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Amir to start. Uh, Selamat pagi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. I think it's a great honor to be invited at this NEU Global Seminar Indonesia project. I've been following the seminars a couple of times uh, with Bahedi, and I've been uh, admiring and reading BIS during my uh, student time. So NEU Indonesia project is very close to my heart. Um, first, I'd like to, uh, I think we, 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 we should take a moment whereby the, uh, the floodings and the, uh, the landslide in East Flores is happening right now. Um, our floating hospital is departing to Adonara, probably in the next one to two days. Uh, hundreds of people are affected. It's not very far from Australia. I think in Timor-Leste also affected. Uh, I, I have a short video, it's about two and a half minutes. If I may, uh, I ask Ruth to play it before I have uh, uh, 15 slides to share with you. A video and photo can tell a more uh, and a full and a thousand words that I can say. Ruth, if you don't mind. Southeast Asia is a region endowed with highly promising economic potential. Unfortunately, financial inclusion is still far from ideal. Only 33% of businesses in the region have access to proper financing. Here to provide a solution to this problem is Investry. Since its inception in 2015, Investry has continued to develop innovative ways for small and medium enterprises across Southeast Asia to gain access to proper financing. This expansion is done while maintaining our position as market leader in Indonesia. As one of the leading financial technology companies in the country, our mission is simple, to use data and technology to make financing more accessible and affordable to SMEs 
while also connect them with lenders who want to help and get attractive returns. Utilizing a B2B approach, Investry offers a wide variety of flagship products, including invoice financing, buyer financing, working capital term loan, online seller financing, mutual funds, and government retail bonds. In Indonesia, the world's most populous Muslim-majority country, we pioneered to provide all of our products in a Sharia-compliant scheme. Our loan organization system verifies, analyzes, grades, and approves each loan to ensure the credit quality of loans in our marketplace. Fund flows between lenders and borrowers go through our bank partner to ensure a secure transaction. We also represent lenders' interests on our loans by monitoring repayments and loan collections, helping lenders to have peace of mind. Investry managed to set itself apart by focusing on the unbanked SME segment, helping them to grow their number of employees as well as their revenue. This focus is further supported by a strong tech, innovation and risk management capabilities, with scalable and robust operational process, and a highly experienced management team, all of which have helped Investry garner many prestigious awards from the Indonesian government, regulators, and international institutions. And Investry will continue to evolve from a provider of innovative products to a creator of ecosystems where our stakeholder can experience scalable growth. Amidst all this, Investry's vision remains to change the way SMEs are financed, to empower growth-oriented SMEs, and to build a resilient digital economy ecosystem in the Southeast Asia region. With Investry, everyone can grow. Thanks. Um, if you can put up the slide, Ruth. Thank you. Let me start a few slides regarding the, the current situations in, in, in the SMEs as well as in the digital economy. I think uh, face, first page of these slides, uh, my profile, I don't need the introductions, uh, I think I already mentioned. Maybe you go to the second slide. Next. Okay, All right. I think uh, everybody should know this and has known this. Digital economy has arrived in Indonesia and affected us in a, in, a, in, a, in a major ways, right? It has shifted the business model. It has shifted the people's behavior and the industrial structures, right? Uh, what is known as a low touch economy or less contact economy, whereby face-to-face -face is minimized, especially during this COVID. This has advanced the hyper-connectivity between the people using the internet. If you're now uh, very familiar with the e-commerce or buying stuff uh, on the line, basically, right? That's uh, already happening and it's growing uh, many times. And the implementation of these e-commerce financial technologies, digital economies, the digital technologies, has encouraged as well the development of SMEs and inclusions. Next uh, slide. Uh, I think there's has been uh, some studies uh, in the CLSA. Uh, COVID-19 has accelerated these adoptions. Uh, one in three has tried uh, these uh, digital ways of doing business during the COVID-19. And the growth in the payment, uh, e-monies has, uh, has, has increased many fold. And I think government has issued a few regulations to encourage them as well. Next slide. I think let's dwell on the rationale. Why is the key drivers for this happening? Uh, I cited four reasons here. One is uh, demographic, demographic development whereby uh, more than 50% of Indonesians are now millennials below 30 years old with a different behavior. Right? Second is actually the advancement in the technology. That is uh, software as well as hardware, satellites, 5Gs, uh, cloud computing. Without the satellites, without the, uh, the, the, the cloud and uh, the ability in the smartphones for the creation, there isn't Gojek, there isn't Grab. Uh, has only started about 14, 15 years ago. Alibaba only started about 20 years ago. 
Tokopedia started about nine to 10 years ago. Infestry started five, six years ago. So it has to do with the development of infrastructures of the technologies, be it on the software and the hardware. Third is actually regulation. I think uh, Bank of Indonesia, OJK, particularly in my space in the financial technology have issued a couple of regulation to encourage the adoptions of the uh, financial technology. The, the last one is actually uh, the economic and market situation, light touch versus high touch economy, the growth of the infrastructures, the EKYC, digital signatures, and so on and so forth, and big tech entering the financial services as well. Let's look at the, the first demographic development, why it really matters. Next slide, please. It, I think some of you may fall into the left-hand side, which I am. The, those who are in the 40s and the 50s. Those below 30s, use how they made their studies and surveys, they are very different than us in terms of the behaviors, the allied generations of so-called Indonesia. They are, there is, there's end of the nine to five houses. And then uh, they, are, they are moving from goods experience, brand to values, instant famous, and so on and so forth. They are known basically as the lazy, self-absorbed, entitled, and like to be in the group. And these are the market. Why? 70% of the lenders in, in, in industry are millennials. Those are below, below, below 30 years old. In the last one year, I think the increase in the retail accounts and brokerage in the stock exchange is dominated as well with this group. The phenomenon of Robin Hood, for example, in the US is similarly happening here in Indonesia as well and dominated by this group. They want convenience, they want speed, they want it now. Right? Next slide. If we look at into the uh, SME space, and this is why we exist and what problems are we solving. We are solving the problem of the credit gap in the SMEs. I think I have to uh, pause here in the sense that there is something called unbanked or uh, under, uh, un unserved, right? But we are, what we are trying to do, I think more in the underserved or underbanked, i.e., yes, there is an issue of financial inclusions and there is a financial inclusion target by the government that has been increasing. Uh, but I think uh, the issue is not only the numbers of account, but whether the formal financial institution have been able to serve these needs, especially in the middle market. Mm -hmm. Why it has not happening is simple because for banks, they, they would rather do 100 million transactions or 10 million transactions rather than 10,000 or 5,000. It's too costly, too costly to do, too costly to process, too costly to collect if something happened, right? And then there is no credit scoring. There is hardly any credit scoring in the sense that the data is not there. The credit history is not there. Unless you use technology, it's very difficult to, to credit score all these small to medium or micro institutions, right? And this is coupled with a lack of financial knowledge among the SMEs themselves, right? And I think despite the government effort to put emphasis on SMEs, whereby the banks are actually required to, to put 40% of the, their portfolio in the SMEs portfolio, I think uh, that's, that number has never been achieved. It's not achieved. Uh, banks are more willing to pay fine rather than just try because it's, it's quite hard, right? And then I think uh, the net interest margin in Indonesia among the highest in the region, probably like 5%. And that, by doing mostly corporates or uh, commercials, is still uh, they still enjoy those margins, right? I think the SMEs issues. If you look at into SMEs in the next slide, this is the pyramid whereby the SMEs are divided, right? I think uh, we have Sarah here and probably Cobra uh, Sikasi. And a lot of people are playing more in the bottom of the pyramids, which are called micros uh, or nano micros, ultra micros. The, the space that we are in, the investor is in right now, it's mostly in the medium space, whereby we find like 200,000 and to three and a half million sales. And we are moving down the curve to small to micros. As we know, I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of economists here, as about six, there are numbers that change numbers are, are different from sources to sources, but 
I think it's sufficient to say maybe like 60 to 65 million MSMEs exist in Indonesia and they contribute more than 90% of the employment and about 60% of GDPs. If we take it only the medium size, our service indicated about 850,000 of them. And they still cons cons constitute about 30 to 36% of the GDPs. And this gap in this SMEs is huge, it's massive. World Bank, I think estimated about, uh, a numbers varies again, between 100 to 175 billion in Indonesia alone. And the Philippines is even higher, it's about 200 billion. I think in Thailand slightly less. But this missing middle, what is called the missing middle, is the underserved in the SMEs, exists in the emerging markets. That's why I think the fintech, the themes of the fintech in Indonesia, fintech payment or fintech lending where, where I am, is mostly on the financial inclusions, how to increase the access to financings to these SMEs. Why is it so? The banks require collaterals, right? The banks, according to Iron Financials, basically the biggest pawn shops, uh, they only lend if you have collaterals, right? If they do unsecured lendings, the problems exist in the sense that they need to provide capitals. I think it's mostly related to capital provisionings, right? So that's considered risky. Second, I think if the company is not profitable or only exists like three years or two years, they won't lend because it's considered risky as well. So that's where I think we are, where we're trying to do using the digital technology, data and technology, to be able to provide more access to SMEs in Indonesia. Next slide. This is a typical case. Uh, I'm pretty sure if you're in Indonesia, you may heard about the ads on Ramayana where it's a, pop, a, a head popping out of the rice cooker. Uh, that guy who created that ad is Iman Safi. He's our, one of our early clients. Iman has these invoices to Ramayana, say for example, 1 billion, right? But he's got another job and he needs a working capital to employ and deploy more people. In order to do that, he comes to us. When we assess his Ramayana, Unilever, Philip Morris or Governor of Indonesia, Unilever will pay, right? Probably late, but they will pay. So once we verify that 1 billion, we give 80% of that, 800 million. With this 800 million, Iman can start a new projects can, can put a down payment for events or whatever, right? So in the surveys that's conducted by Lambaga Demography of Indonesia in the next slide, you'll see about 56% of the SMEs that we help that have financing from us. Can you go to the next slide, please? That has the financing from us, about 58% has an increase in their sales, 44% increase in their employment, and they gain more trust, I, they get more financing from other finance companies or banks or other fintech companies, right? This study has been done, I think, prior to COVID, but the, the, the impact is still re relatively the same, I would say. In fact, in fact, more during this COVID period, we see an increase in demand for loans because the smaller banks or the mid-sized banks are stop lending basically because the shift of the um, deposits and the third party funds to a larger banks. So the larger banks, which are mostly uh, our shareholders as well, we got Bank Mandiri, Bank BRI, and MUFG and Bank Danamon as, as our shareholders, partners with us to originate the loans for them in the MSME space. Next slide. Investry has been established for five years. Um, we started, I studied our investry together with uh, two other partners, Adrian and uh, KCs. Uh, since five years, uh, the, the team has grown from five to 250 people now. And we just got a license in Thailand and the Philippines. We bring the same playbook because the credit gap or the missing middle also exists in those countries. And we have a Sharia and uh, a license as well, and Sharia product, uh, because uh, a lot of demands there from the lenders as well as borrowers. And we just uh, launched an initiative called Beyond Lending. So we are not only now trying to, to provide lending, we try to provide more so that the SMEs uh, will be uh, able, we will be able to provide a lot more to the SMEs. Uh, one of the key things that we are developing is an AI SMEs credit scoring, a joint venture we call I4C. 
And what we have been trying to develop as well with the FinTech from Switzerland is, is an electronic financing. E-invoicing is very crucial actually for a country like us. In Turkey, for example, is a, is a must, is um, uh, that people who issue electronics gotta be in electronics whereby that way actually the government can uh, obtain more tax uh, in, a, in a more uh, um, you know, uh, efficient manners because there is a credit, uh, 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 what you call it, the, the credit traces in the electronic ways for, 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 for us to be able to verify. For us, the biggest issue is fraud, i.e. whether this re these companies really what they, say, what they say they are, the invoices are what they say they are fraud, right? So the, the model we have in this next slide is simple. Uh, the OJK has issued these regulations in 2000, uh, I believe 2017, POJK 77. So basically a FinTech lending is a platform. We do not lend from our balance sheet. We meet, we, we just a platform, just consider us like eBay, but it's for money basically, right? Those who have excess monies and those who have who need monies, they can meet in our platform. Who are these borrowers? They are SMEs, they are vendors, they are suppliers. In our case, we do not lend to individuals. We only focus on SMEs, PT and CV, basically. And uh, we only take invoices from three largest groups, which are government, uh, multinational company, or selected uh, listed companies. The investors or the lenders, sorry, the, the, the word should be lenders. The lenders are twofold, i.e. either the retail lenders. We have now about 35,000 lenders across Indonesia. It's all really across Indonesia from uh, Sabang to Morocco. Uh, the borrowers are still largely in Java. We started to go into Sumatra. Uh, the, 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 the composition now, we also have about 50% the lenders are institutions, 50% from retail. When I started out, when we started out, I think about 95% uh, are retail. Uh, we started the shift to institutions uh, consciously uh, the last three years, two years, whereby now we have a lot of cooperation with banks, finance company, as well as from offshore so provide. What we do, basically we match between borrowers and lenders. We do the due diligence, we administer the loan and we help in collections. The people or the borrowers apply online and then we, we credit score them with our credit scoring uh, engine that comes into a, a rating. This rating will determine the interest rate. The interest is between 12% to 20% per annum. On average is about 16%. I think before COVID, the average tenors of those invoices, 85% of our product are invoices financing uh, are about 70, 70 days. This, this has gone up maybe like 90 to 100 days. Uh, because the, uh, in, 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 during the COVID, I think that the terms of trade has uh, extended, even the likes of the multinationals. Next slide. This is uh, what we have achieved so far. I think cumulatively we have, uh, last year we did about 3.2 trillion. In 2019, we did about 2.4 trillion. Uh, this cumulative loans probably contributed about 10% in the uh, productive loan sectors in the country. There are probably 150, I think 148 FinTech players registered by OJK, but 45 of them got a full license. We are one of the full license one. I think we disbursed about 5.7 trillion and the outstanding amount about 850 billion is about 15% of the total productive loans in the country for, from the fintech sectors. The TKB 90 is actually like the measurements of the portfolio qualities, whereby if it is uh, late for 90 days, it's considered uh, NPL. It had gone up through the COVID period, but uh, luckily it's still, fortunately still manageable. It's about 1.5%. Uh, the industry is about four to 5%. We have about 31,000 here, but I think more uh, in the retail sec uh, segments. And we have about uh, close to 2,000 active borrowers. These are PT and service across, uh, across the countries. Next, I'll give you two cases whereby uh, we have we've gone down the curve now to, uh, to the small to micros. We have this partnership with Gramindo. Gramindo is actually like cooperative, but they are digital cooperative in central Java using the Gramin model. 
uh, whereby uh, they have women and the women form a group and the group will provide a guarantee among each other. Uh, I'm going to Jogja this uh, Friday. Since our uh, cooperations uh, at the end of the year, we have achieved uh, 1,000 uh, borrowers, so 1,000 women across uh, at Java that we've been providing the loans. They're, these are very, very small ticket items like uh, uh, 2 million until 10 million uh, for, for, for women to help productive uh, you know, uh, producing, uh, you know, something like group book or whatever, a small scale, ultra micro, nano micro type of markets. And the amazing thing so far, zero NPL. So uh, I think Yunus, Professor Yunus has a very high convictions on these sectors. Women, when they give you, when, when given monies, uh, they, they tend to be better than men in the sense that, uh, you know, and I, I, I believe I, I experienced that as well. Whenever I give some money to my mom, the first thing she come back is providing some more food to me. I, then they're providing and helping the other members of the families, right? Maybe, maybe men, uh, uh, you know, thinking about something else. But I think Professor Yunus, when I attended one of his uh, lectures in uh, Singapore and NTU, explained in very good ways about how the men and women uh, in terms of uh, managing monies and why he thinks that uh, women entrepreneurs are actually uh, a segment that's uh, really uh, quite bankable. Right? The second segment, second slide is that we just started uh, about a few months ago as well, uh, our cooperation with eFishery. eFishery is an IoT, it's an off the internet of things in aquaculture, whereby they have these uh, this machine that control uh, in terms of the fit, fit lot to the fishes, mostly shrimp or uh, mujair, you know, ikan mas, the sort of things in the Java, Sumatra, and they expand to uh, Sulawesi and Kalimantan. We are providing financing to those petambak, uh, you know, the aqu uh, aquaculture farmers uh, and together with e-fishery. So they, we have some pre-selections and together with them, we provide within the ecosystem. I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry if it, if it, if it is a bit rushed. There are too many things I want to tell in such a short time, but we'll be happy to take questions and answers later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Amir. That was really fascinating. Thank you. Um, and now I would like Ibu to invite Ibu Sara to speak. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. It truly is an honor. And um, it's really fascinating to hear from you also, Pa Amiruddin. As I was listening to you, it's like ideas are already popping to my head and how much we actually are trying to do very similar things from different uh, angles. So, yeah, I think hopefully this, this will also spark more conversations between us as well. So anyway, um, I hope it's okay. Can I already start sharing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me share my screen. And um, okay. Uh, okay, is it already visible? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So hi, my name is Sarah and I'm the founder of Do It Happy and we are an e-payment for the Unbank. So uh, as, as Bamir was mentioning that the whole bunch, like over 50% of Indonesians actually don't have bank accounts. There's, they're unbanked and this makes payment and especially mass payments extremely difficult because everything has to be made physically in person. So on the left here, if you see the picture, is this is an a distribution, a scene of a distribution in Indonesia where people are, are just like um, risking their lives to basically get a bag of rice. And this is really a huge problem. And I face this myself. When um, before I founded Do It Happy, I was um, I was a finance director director for MCA Indonesia Malayam Challenge Account in Asia. So I manage a six hundred million dollar fund from the U.S. government to reduce poverty in Indonesia. And um, even though at that time we had oh, our bank was a bank with the largest network in Indonesia, we tried everything um, in in order to make sure. Uh, we could distribute uh, money in an accountable manner. And even though we tried everything, it nothing worked. And it, I found it really, really unbelievable that the only way 
we could have at work. The only way was to have my staff actually carry the money in sacks, little sacks, and, and just like give it, put an envelope and give it one by one. Uh, and if, I thought like if, if an organization with $600 million grant with the US government, Indonesian government, and the bank with uh, the largest network in Indonesia can't do it, then basically nobody can. Everybody's facing this problem. So I resigned from my position. I founded Dwee Tape um, as a solution for this. And so what Dwee Tape is, is an e-payment that is designed to meet the needs of the unbanked poor. So all you need is face, pin, shop. So there's no card, no phone, no bank required. So, um, okay. I'm gonna play a, a video kind of like to see, uh, to show how it works. Okay. So here, face, pin shop, no card, no smartphone, no bank. So in this case, um, the gentleman on the right is an aid recipient. He wants to redeem a plate of food. Uh, and the lady on the left, she is the owner of the food kiosk. And so she scans the person's face. The R system then uh, retrieves the information and verifies this, this is in fact the correct person. And then, so all he has to do after this is just enter his PIN on the merchant's phone and then select the e-voucher for a plate of food and voila, transaction is complete. And the lady receives immediate payment and he gets his uh, plate of rice. And this, our idea here is because uh, we adjust the technology to help people that we are serving in this case, some people don't actually have phones or are unable to um, operate phones. So with this, um, we've been serving people between the ages of five and 80 years old and even the disabled, um, people with stroke, uh, people with uh, children, um, and also um, like uh, with, with Down syndrome. Uh, so basically the way it works is that um, the client then provides us with a list of recipients. We then create an account and distribute the e-vouchers for them. The beneficiaries then simply uh, redeem the voucher at the, their neighborhood store. And the agents, which are these stores, just sell the goods that they would usually do and receive digital payment via Duitape. So with this, everyone wins, whether it's a client, whether it's us, whether it's beneficiaries or the agents. The clients, they get an easy, efficient, safe, traceable, accountable way of uh, doing aid distribution, uh, and they actually get quite a lot of savings. For us, it's um, it's basically our bread and butter. This is where we're, um, we make our money. For beneficiaries, it's easy because uh, they can just redeem at nearby stores. It's very much just like shopping. There's no lines, there's no bobs, and they have the freedom to choose what they need within a list of like whitelisted items. Um, type of thing. So they can't buy cigarettes or alcohol, for example. And then the agents, they're sig they significantly increase their sales and they also gain a financial history. So with this model, we actually grew 50 times on the onset of COVID. So while many other companies actually declined, we're, we're very happy that we grew, um, we grew exponentially. If comparing year by year, uh, 2020 versus 2019, we grew uh, 13 times. I think this is the uh, numbers from, from end of last year, 39,000, 28,000 agents and three and a half million dollars of gross transaction value. But then it goes beyond that. So um, we've distributed over a million dollars worth of funds to over 200,000 people, but it's not just that, it's also the economic impact that we create. So um, it's not just the beneficiaries that receives the aid, but it's also these stores where we boost the economy and help them. And then they would then in turn buy from their wholesalers, the wholesalers would buy from distributors and there's a multiplier effect. And we've been able to do this in, uh, we've done this in 17 cities and districts and not just like uh, around um, Java, uh, also um, in, in Bali, in Lombok, uh, Nusa Tenggara Barat, and also in Sulawesi. And these are in often very small villages uh, that barely have any internet, but uh, we're able to make this work. And 
um, everything is actually done um, very efficiently and virtually mostly. So here, okay. This is also another video that kind of shows um, what, uh, how our, our system works. And here it's, we're programmed with MasterCard and with uh, World Vision. And the thing is like, if you see MasterCard logo on a store, you would think that it is, uh, that MasterCard is accepted there, no. They wanted to distribute, um, they, but they couldn't. Even the, a company with the largest, uh, one of the biggest uh, payment companies in the world, they actually needed our help in order to be able to reach um, the people at the bottom of the pyramid. So I'm gonna play, um, I think it's better here. <laughs> Ribuan warga Jakarta Utara menerima donasi bahan pangan berupa voucher digital atau e-voucher duit HP. Donasi diberikan sebagai bentuk kepedulian terhadap warga terdampak COVID-19. Direktur Utama Duit HP, Sarah Dewanto, mengatakan donasi diberikan kepada warga terdampak ekonomi akibat COVID-19 dalam bentuk e-voucher melalui aplikasi Duit HP. Donasi dapat dibelanjakan dengan beragam bahan pangan, mulai dari telur, ikan, daging sapi, daging ayam, sayur, hingga buah di mitra agen yang telah ditunjuk. Kami sebagai perusahaan di bidang jasa keuangan dan teknologi memfasilitasi penyaluran donasi yang diberikan kepada penerima manfaat. Kami bekerja sama dengan Wahana Visi Indonesia dan Mastercard. Kata Sarah saat ditemui di Tokomus RW7, Kelurahan Penjaringan, Kecamatan Penjaringan, Jakarta Utara, Jumat 17 Juli 2020. Untuk dapat berbelanja, dijelaskannya penerima manfaat hanya dapat mendatangi mitra agen sesuai keinginannya. Verifikasi akun dilakukan oleh pemilik mitra agen dengan melakukan screening wajah. Jika data diri sesuai dalam aplikasi, maka penerima manfaat dapat berbelanja senilai saldo yang dimilikinya. Tim Liputan Kominfotik Jakarta Utara melaporkan. So that's kind of a, kind of gives the idea of, of how we work. Um, and so this, uh, we're, as, as we grew um, 13 times within the past year, we didn't grow alone. We actually brought um, our partners who are these SMEs, MSME um, stores, uh, and together with them, we, we, we boost the economy. This is a, a video, I'll just show you one, but... Um... Saya Ibu Erna, dari Toko Wahyudin. I'm oh, sorry. Saya usaha di Kampung Pulau, Jatinegara, yang padat penduduknya nih, Pak. Omsetnya sebelum COVID, alhamdulillah 5 juta per hari. Tapi setelah ada COVID, menurunnya hampir 50 persen. Sekitar 2 juta sampai 3 juta per harinya. Untungnya waktu itu saya diajak kerjasama Ame Duit, duit HP. Alhamdulillah omset saya meningkat. Lebih malah Pak bisa jadi. Sehari saya bisa 6 sampai 7 juta. Sama saya berkira dari Toko Seba, penghasilan saya setiap harinya sebelum corona 3 jutaan habis itu selama corona 3 bulan itu penghasilan saya menurun jadi 1 juta 500 an setelah itu saya bergabung dengan duit HP setelah bergabung dengan duit HP dan mengikuti programnya Alhamdulillah sangat terbantu banget uh, yang biasanya siang selama corona itu saya dapat satu juta lima ratus sekarang udah mulai dua juta lima ratus sampai tiga juta. Nama saya. Yeah. So it actually goes on and on. There's several, but it's basically the same story over and over. Is that saya uh, ibu. we actually were able to increase their sales. Uh, on average, uh, the stores that work with us, we increased their sales. Last year was about $4,200 in one month, which is quite good for, for these kind of uh, mom and pop shops. And, and so we found that like really great. Um, and for our clients, we give high accountability live data reports. So you get to know who bought what, when, where. 
And in this case, the information is really, really valuable because like we know exactly what's being bought. And probably if you're looking at this, you're like, why is uh, people would um, understand if like aid recipients, the first thing they would buy is rice. But then what's the second thing is blender is a lot of people like were really scratching their heads when when we had this information. So basically this was um, one of the programs where it was for uh, fr flood victims around Jakarta. And then so it was very interesting that this is because we gave them freedom to choose from uh, basically like I think 80 groups of things that they can buy. And this is what they chose. So first one, no surprise, everybody needs rice. But then the number two, was blender and everybody was surprised but then after we we looked into it, it it became so obvious because the people in the river um on the river sides in indonesia the river side is not the fancy part of town where restaurants are but that's where the slums are so a lot of people that live in the slums actually have a um an informal job in many cases of selling food and what is it about indonesian food is that there's a lot of spices. So you would use uh, an ulakan or a mortar and pestle. If it's just for your family, that's fine. But if you're selling it, what do you need? You need a blender. And because without the blender, they actually lose their means of, um, of, of, of earning a living. And what happens when there's a flood is your blender just goes kaput. And so that after the first thing they needed was to eat, number th number uh, two thing that they needed was actually a blender so they could start earning a living again. And we just found that fascinating, the kind of information and data that we could get from here. So anyway, the market size is huge. We're talking about over 130 million unbanked Indonesians. Um, there's a lot of uh, players in fintech payments, um, but everybody requires some kind of use of a phone or a smartphone. All we need is a face. That's it. And our growth strategy is like first it's aid distribution, but that is only the beginning because we truly believe that after that uh, it's it's good and all, but uh, it's only every once in a while when you need it. But Payment is, is, is a very important thing that everybody needs access to. Um, and so we're already launching this year is commercial payments. So um, whether it is for a buyer who buys, um, who wants to buy from, from farmers, um, and then right now they have to pay all in cash, or if it is a, uh, a factory that has payroll and they, uh, a lot, since a, a, they have a lot of unbanked workers, they would do the payroll in cash, as well as um, lenders. Uh, for example, like with, with, with Investry, there's uh, potentially, I mean, if you will, if you need the, to be able to make payments to the unbanked, that is actually what we want to enable is, is digital payments to the unbanked uh, as well. And then so this is this is something that we believe is very important. And the third is the data play. Um, because right now nobody has nobody has information about this uh, about this segment because it's everything is is uh, just manual. But here we have very detailed information that we would be able to um, enable them to have some kind of credit scoring, um, to have uh, help the government with data-driven policies. And this kind of data play, um, we believe this is really, really important. Um, and so, for example, for, for the lending, the way we do it is we, have, we create a payment ecosystem where we reduce the risk of the lenders. So um, one of the biggest reasons why like the people here, um, the underbanked or the unbanked, they cannot get loans is because there's, uh, there's no certainty whether or not the money would be actually used to pay for whatever it's intended to, for whatever the production, productive uh, use it is for. But then with us, our system enables that they only use it very much like we do for aid, but aid, we make sure that they buy like, I don't know, food rather than alcohol or or, uh, or 
uh, cigarettes. In here is that if it's for a farmer, then uh, that they only only buy it for farming supplies and seeds and um, and uh, fertilizer, for example. So it ensures that the money is well used. That's number one. And number two is that we actually work together uh, with the buyers um, as well as aggregators to ensure that um, the buyers would be through us. So uh, I think Pamir and you were also mentioning, uh, like for us, we look at, at ourselves as, as almost like Tokopedia, where we ensure that uh, once the buyer pays to them, um, that they would, uh, we would immediately deduct what is the amount owed so that the lenders get repaid first before the rest of the proceeds actually go to the SMEs or the farmers. So uh, we reduce the risk on making sure that it's used for what it's intended for. And number two is that we, in, we reduce the risk by ensuring that all of the payments go through our system and that the loans are repaid uh, before it goes to uh, the borrower. So that's, that's how uh, we work from the, uh, on this. And this is already something that we're trying on, that we're already starting with our own merchants as well as um, on some uh, projects as well for uh, farming. Uh, um, yeah. So we are actually, we got um, uh, an investment from ADB, uh, ADB Ventures. So we're actually the first company that Asian Development Bank uh, Ventures invested in. Um, and basically, uh, because we, we provide an innovative solution for aid payments to the low stratus society, we're very clean, accountable, and it also boosts the economy. But then actually, they, it goes far beyond just aid. Thank so, you. So, sorry, we have yeah, one more right minute, here. if that's okay. Yes, I'm already done. So we have a very strong, experienced team. Um, and we last year, we, uh, we won several international awards. We won um, the APEC Global Innovation Science and Technology um, Award uh, in Chile. And then last year, we won the Sankal Global Awards uh, in financial inclusion. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sara. Now I would like to invite uh, Pak Leon from Koperasi Kasi Indonesia. Thanks, Pak. Hello everyone, I'm Leon. Nice to be with all of you today. And thank you for your sharing, Pak, Amir, Pak Amiruddin and uh, Bu Sarah. I think you both are more senior yeah, in campus. Thank you. And uh, I see a lot of connection actually uh, from your presentation. And thank you for the committee to have, for having me and Ferry, my colleague here today for the presentation. So uh, allow me to share screen first. Could you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm Leon and I will be, I'm from Koprasi Kasi Indonesia and I will be sharing with uh, my colleague, Ferry. Um, we are going to share about the topic here, which is about um, what we are doing. We are not a FinTech. We are a traditional uh, Grameen, sort to say Grameen-like uh, microfinance institutions. And in relation to the pandemic. My colleague Ferry will present first about uh, what is KKI and we will, and then we will go deeper about the pandemic related issue. Please Ferry. Good morning everyone. Um, first, uh, let me introduce you to Koperasi Kasi Indonesia or KKI. Uh, KKI's vision is to be present for, involved with, and support poor families wherever they are. We were founded in 2011. Uh, currently, we have 10,325 active members in six districts around North Jakarta. As of February 2021, our average loan size is 208 US dollars. Our outstanding portfolio is 1.24 million US dollars, and our total disbursed loan is 14 million US dollars. We believe uh, that the poor can exit poverty if they have uh, opportunities and readiness. So we don't only give loans to our members. We also give mindset trainings and savings facilities. All the supports we give are still technologically limited. So all interactions are still offline and face-to-face. -face. 
the next part of this presentation will be delivered by Pak Leonard. Thank, Thank you. you very. So uh, in regards to our members, they are sort to say the member being served by Ritape, uh, low income or poor women, more, all, all in rural areas, which is in North Jakarta. And then they, all of them run a ultra micro business. This is also a bit like Gramindo there, which Pa uh, Amirudian shared before. So that's the context of our members. So it's all women. Uh, running ultra micro businesses. So what happened then during the pandemic? I will continue here. So the first, uh, the key challenges that we are facing during the pandemic is of course the worries that we might contact the virus. So we don't know the situation, especially in the beginning. We worry that our team, because it's offline, this is the difference with Infestry and with Happy because it's offline. Our team would, would go to the field, uh, disburse the loan and getting the repayments. We worry that our team will, will contact the virus. That would be the first thing. And then second thing is that uh, because of the road closures, it's becoming more difficult, especially in the beginning of the local Indonesia type lockdown. It, it is difficult for us to go to members house to do disbursements because we cannot have gathering of people, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first challenges. The second challenges during the pandemic is, of course, and this is the main one actually, sig the significant drop in members' income. In the video shown by uh, Ibu uh, Sarah, uh, we can see that the two small business owners state that their income dropped by 50%. And that's actually the case uh, that we face as well. Actually, this even smaller one, the one who doesn't have a war room or a small stall. For example, those who would sell uh, food using grobak or uh, what is it like the one that you put a uh, stall that you can move uh, on the street, for example, selling food. Selling food in the beginning of the pandemic, some of them were not allowed to sell food. They cannot do their business. So in the beginning of pandemic. 60 to 80 percent of our members had to stop their micro business and those who are still not running it have a significant uh, drop in their income and then uh, to add to that uh, their spouse uh, the spouse of our members mostly do informal work like uh, driving an online uh, motorcycle uh, taxi or becoming this uh, working in the port carrying stuff which is all of it uh, were affected by the pandemic. This is one of the quote by, from our members, uh, from our team when they talk to members. There's one member who told me that she had no income at all for at least two weeks. So that's pretty, pretty heavy for the poor. She had uh, muscle stock available, but basically nobody could buy because of the local trade pro prohibition. So it was a really tough time for the poor. There is a saying, whatever we experience during this pandemic, it's challenging, we cannot go out, etc. Uh, our income uh, went down. You can multiply that at least five times uh, of that difficulty is being experienced by the poor. So that's the first. Um, and then, sorry, let me hide this. Yeah, so what do we do then? Uh, what do we do then in response to that pandemic? As Ferry shared before, our vision is simple. We want to be there with the poor. We want to be involved with their life and we want to support them. So the, the very first priority during the pandemic is we know uh, that our members have difficulty with their income. So we want to help by reducing their repayment burden through the following. The first is that we apply four week repayment holiday uh, and we also halt or stop our loan disbursement, no loan disbursements for around three months. And then we, after the four week holiday, we also following it with restruct, multiple uh, restructuring of the repayments starting from 10%. So if member would pay us like 60,000 rupiah, uh, about probably $5, or four to five dollars per week, then they only have to pay 10% of it, up to 50% of uh, repayment. 
So it's various uh, and it lasts for eight months. This is also to help our members because we know they are, you know, sometimes they don't have money to buy food um, in the extreme cases. So we own them to not being, not having additional burden of having to repay a loan. But we apply the, if you see the 10%, because it's very important that our members keep their repayment discipline. That's why we still ask for repayment, even though as small as 10%. This is one of the quote again. Uh, of the members, I really thought we have to keep paying. And some of them, they are quite ready for it, even though it's very heavy, because the rule says so. And then they were surprised to find that we give them a repayment holiday for, 10 uh, for four weeks, and then followed up by around 10 weeks of 10% uh, restructuring. So that the aim was clear, we want to reduce repayment burden for our members. And then the second thing is that we would like, we want to be there and help them even for just a bit. So we decided that at that time uh, we have some cash reserved. We decided to use that to disperse five kilograms of rice to uh, around 9,500 members. So each of them received the five kilogram of rice. It's just a bit actually, but with this, we want to show to our members that we know they're having difficulty and we want to support with what we could based on our vision. But then miraculously, God is so good. Um, some of our team and our family, they started this um, sort of say campaign to share, hey, KKI is giving rice for free. Would you like to help? And by the end of the year, all of the costs of distributing rice uh, have been covered by donors, by donations, which is something that we didn't plan in the beginning. So it's really good uh, and it's really amazing. In the time of difficulty, people, there are a lot of people who care and they channel their support through us, just like the MasterCard uh, did that through with Hape. And then the third priority for our members is that we want to help them to bounce back as soon as possible. Uh, as I shared before, since March, end of March, uh, we stop or halt the disbursement of new loans because we were worried in that time, uh, in that period of time where people cannot do business or their income really drop, their sales really drop. If they get a new loan, inevitably they will use it uh, for consumption. And if one, if a person use loan, productive loan for consumption, it will only create a bigger problem for themselves. So we stop the loan. But then when we assess that the condition was quite stable, we decided to take the risk and restart the loan distribution uh, in July, so around three months later. But we didn't just start. We really, really want to help our members to bounce back because what happened is this. During that, uh, the worst of the pandemic between March uh, to June, uh, people uh, basically, they're, they don't separate money for their business and their daily lives, most of the ultra micro business owners. So when the income uh, or the sales drop from their business, they don't have enough money for consumption. So they just take out the uh, capital or the money from their business and use it for daily consumption. So by the time around July, when government started to ease the quote, quote, unquote, Indonesia type lockdown, they no longer have money to start their business while the economy started to, to move, sort to say. People can go to work again. They can start selling rice again, uh, open their warung or small stall, but they don't have money to do that. So um, in two months, between uh, July to August, uh, we disbursed uh, around loans of almost a million dollars to 4,000 members. So they can again, get the working capital that they need so they can start again their business and start in uh, getting more income for the family, getting bound, uh, bouncing back faster. That's the third. And then the fourth priority is that we also tried other things possible. There's interesting thing about COVID-19 prevention. We would say, I, we, I heard, I don't know for sure, in Australia, it's really good. And in Indonesia, people would say, you know, don't go out stay at home, but how could you do that as a poor? They don't have savings. They, if they don't work, they don't eat. And if you stay at home for the poor, the home would mean something like 20 meters square of home. Some doesn't even have window. 
So that's really, really tough. But we tried what we could. Uh, we know it's really challenging given their context. So we tried to uh, continuously educating them, you know, that they don't have to, to be scared of COVID, but they have to be always careful. They have to maintain distance, wear masks, blah, blah, blah. Even for masks, for example, it's an additional cost or expense. And to have or to spend on masks when you don't have enough rice, for example, that is really challenging. Uh, so we try to continuously educating them, reminding them to be aware and to be careful. We also uh, gave, this is very, very little, by the way, uh, one poster for each member. So they can put at home, reminds them that they need to be careful. Just for, your, uh, for the information, uh, during the COVID-19 period, the death rate of our members increased uh, 50 to 70% few of them was, uh, were uh, identified as COVID-19 victims, but this, this is definitely, definitely an anomaly. It's 50 to 70% increase in the death toll of our members. We track this because we give insurance to our members. Uh, if they pass away, they, don't have, they don't, no longer have to pay the loan. We also uh, blessed to receive donation of one mask and one can of biscuit. Uh, from donors and we channel it to our members. And we also try to register our members for the government cash aid called BPUM. Uh, we register nine, over 9,000 uh, members, but only uh, around 4,000 receive it, which is 2.4 million uh, rupiah per person. So we try everything that we can to support our members based on our vision. And then what happened next? Uh, I'm sorry, I... I want to take this off. Um, ah, okay, let me push it uh, here. Uh, the title of the uh, the title is rain, is rainbow after the rain. What what does it mean? So those efforts to support our members took a toll on us. I mean, like our name is Koprasi Kasi. Kasi is quoting. Uh, it's like compassion in English. But in Indonesia, the word kasi means two things. It means compassion and it means giving. So show, uh, living our vision, we give to our members and it definitely inevitably took a toll on us. We recorded uh, almost 100,000 loss, uh, US dollar loss in 2020 uh, versus uh, more than 100, almost $130,000 profit in 2019. So it's like totally flipped down, flipped from profit to loss, mainly due to repayment restructuring and the uh, rise distribution. And then our members dropped by 4%, quite stable, but it's uh, slowing down and uh, decreasing to 9,500 by the end of 2020. But there is this story I would like to share with you. In the beginning of pandemic, when we start, already started um, giving repayment holiday to our members, I recall one day I was in a car going back from the office. And uh, sorry for being melancholic. I was literally crying because it was so uncertain. I have this anxiety. How can we pay our five, 55 uh, employee salary? How, how, would, how would it be for our members? And it was raining, by the way. So it's, uh, the sky was quite dark. But then uh, I saw at a say, uh, not so long after that, in the same trip, I saw a rainbow. And it was really beautiful. And I felt uh, God strengthened me. He, is, he was like saying, you know, after the dark sky and heavy rains, you'll see rainbow. It will be like that for KKI. And by the way, it happened. Let's take a look here. We maintain our bad debt at 0%. Uh, our... Cumulative bad debt since our inception is around 0.0000.4%. And we maintain in the period of pandemic from March until today, literally 0% uh, bad debt. And then uh, by last February, our members grew to over 10,000 members, which exceeded pre-pandemic figures. And this is the very first time we reached 10,000 members. Some of uh, the new clients, new members, thought that, you know, since they heard KKI distributing rice during the pandemic, they, they really wait to join KKI. We didn't demand for that, for marketing tool. We want to have 
we want to help members, but actually there is a unexpected return on that. And then the third point here, average loan size have increased significantly compared to pre-pandemic level. It's about 25% from $165 to $208. This is because um, uh, for context, uh, the buying power, the income level of our members dropped during pandemic, even until today. So we propose a solution for them so they can, so that they can still receive loan and even a bigger loan than they used to receive before, but still, but paying less in terms of installment. And the key is in the loan duration. So before pandemic, majority of our members repay their loan in 25 weeks. And then after the pandemic, we moved them to repay in 40 weeks duration. So with that long, given that longer duration of repayment, they can get bigger loan and repay uh, less of installment, which can really suitable to help them during this difficult time. And uh, given that uh, bad debt remain at 0%, members grew, average loan size grew, revenues have increased beyond pre-pandemic level. So really, after the rain, there is a rainbow. And all of the above really were the answers from our members, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they return the compassion that they receive from KKI. There is a story I will share quickly. I hope we still have time. Some of the traditional microfinance institution like KKI, they would go to the field and getting, trying to get a repayment from members and some still don't get it. During the heaviest or the peak uh, lockdown time, we cannot go to the field and it's too risky as well. So we ask our members book Ibu is the word for uh, Indonesian uh, women. That's the older one. Bu, could you please come to the office? We cannot go to your place. Would you please come and do repayment in our office? And you know, they came. 100% of them came to our office to do repayment. Some came to, to pay a repayment of, I would use uh, Indonesian rupiah, uh, like 100,000 rupiah of repayment and they would spend 30,000 or 40,000, 30,000 uh, rupiah in their transportation. There's a good part in it, which is we see our members really committed to the repayment, but that also gave us a thought that we need to move to uh, newer technology where they could repay uh, easier through transfer or through the happy kind of thing so they don't have to come to our office. This is something that we are looking for in the future. So that's the KKI in the pandemic and the committee of this event asked us to give a thought about, you know, a policy, uh, policy that we would like to see uh, for the poor uh, in relation to this pandemic. And my colleague, uh, Ferry will share this again and we'll close the presentation. Ferry, please go ahead. Thank you, Payan. Um, so based on what uh, Payan has delivered and from all the things that we experienced during the, this pandemic, we would like to see some uh, policies. Uh, first, we, we hope the government will establish more targeted COVID-19 prevention effort. Business, especially the informal sector, should, should be allowed to still run, with, uh, but with regular education and inspection from the government because the poor cannot afford not to work. They has no or very little savings. If they don't work, they almost couldn't eat. Uh, number two, uh, we would like to see increased vaccination efforts. Uh, and we think the government should prioritize the poor uh, who need it the most. Uh, Paleon said uh, in the beginning, they really got hit harder by the pandemic than the rest of us. And finally, we think that the government should give aid that is more effectively targeted uh, as Paleon was saying, more than 50% of KKI members didn't receive the test, uh, the test aid, even though they perfectly fit the profile. Some also didn't get the basic need support, such as rice, cooking oils, uh, noodles, uh, and we suspect maybe this is caused by the government that, that data management issue. And we believe if uh, these three policies are put in place, uh, at least we all can deal, uh, especially the poor, and deal with it, with this pandemic more uh, calmly. Uh, 
we hope that uh, all we share uh, will be beneficial for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leon and Ferry. That was really, really fascinating. And I'm going to open now for the question and answer. Um, I would like to invite um, Peter McCauley, Sarah Dong, and uh, Mas Budi to, to ask their questions or provide comments. Thank you. Pak Peter first. Baiklah, terima kasih. You can hear me, yeah? Is that okay? Yes. yes. Uh, okay, I have I have a question to uh, <coughs> to each of the uh, peserta, the, each of the presenters, Pa uh, Amir, Ibu Sara, and uh, Pak Leon. Uh, for uh, Pa Amir, uh, could I terima kasih yeah, the information about Investry? I have, uh, by the way, loaded your website while you have been talking to me. So I've got your website here in front of me. It's a good website. Terima kasih ya. Lengkap dengan banyak informasi. A lot of information on your website. But what I'm, I'm just looking and I can't quite see it from your website. At present, how much uh, are you dispersing roughly per annum? Kira kira berapa? And also uh, mainly uh, what, what are your leading sectors? So that's my first question. My first question to pa, uh, pa Amir. To uh, Ibu Sara, uh, terima kasih. I've got just several questions. Uh, maybe you mentioned this, but I, I didn't quite pick it up. Pada uh, umumnya, uh, in an average year, how many people, kira kira berapa ribu, yeah? How many people are you reaching out to? Landas kedua, pertanyaan kedua, kesan saya, you mainly Pada umumnya, yeah, mainly in Java. I, is that right? Or I think you did mention some other areas as well. So perhaps you could just give us a little bit of information on, on the areas. And then pertanyaan ketiga, melihat ke depan, looking to the future, what about expanding into rural areas, daerah pedesaan? Do you, do you have plans for that? Are you reaching out? out? And then... Uh, then uh, for for pa, uh, uh, for pa Leon, uh, pa Leon, you you perhaps did mention this, and 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 I missed it. I just got one question to you, pa. What is your main source of funds? Dana dapat dana dari mana? You're talking about the distribution pembagiannya, the distribution of the dana, and I think you probably did tell us about the sumber dana, uh, but. Perhaps you could just explain that. So there, there are pertanyaan to, to each of the peserta. Terima kasih, ya. Thank you, Pak. In the interest of time, I'll take three questions at a go. Uh, Sarah, uh, would you like to ask a question or provide comments? Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I learned so much uh, from your presentations. Uh, I think it's, it's really fascinating to learn from people who are actually on the ground because uh, we are sitting you know, in a different country and just imagining things. Uh, I found the policy uh, suggestion of actually prior prioritizing poor people in vaccination very, very, actually very good. I never thought that way because I think most governments are prioritizing other groups. But in a country like Indonesia, I think, yeah, that, that would be actually a good uh, way of thinking about it. Uh, I only have one question. It's uh, uh, to Ibu Sarah. So I'm just wondering how you get a baseline uh, information about the face because uh, you do need to know what they look like before you uh, decide who is uh, you know uh, getting the aid right so where did you get that information thank you thanks Sarah uh, Mas Budi okay um, thank you very much for the presentation so uh, my question probably a bit general um, as far as I understand, um, uh, UKM has been dealing with credit, uh, well, since uh, for a long time. And they, beside the formal credit, a lot of them are actually dealing with informal credit, which is uh, Tangkula uh, and so on. Now, so the market for credit uh, in many UKM has been occupied uh, quite a lot actually by this group, which is the informal credit. So when I was small, I go to uh, Pasar Boplo, I can see a lot of these uh, people that's uh, offering informal credit. Now, 
So the, the issue, my understanding, the issue is, yes, probably there is some part of the issue is that there isn't enough uh, credit for micro and small enterprise, but also the other issue is that uh, the problem with this informal uh, creditor uh, is that their interest rate is so high. So, but they have a reason why this interest rate is so high. Yeah? So then uh, people uh, working in uh, small credit are being trapped, either they take a very big uh, a loan or, um, or they do not have access to investment. So then you guys coming in and basically uh, in a way uh, develop as a competitor of this informal uh, people. So because of this informal people get less client, what they're going to do is actually increasing their interest rate if somebody is actually uh, willing to take their loan. So what you guys do is actually, yes, you might save some of them, but some other, which is most likely the weak one, they could get trapped with the informal sector, informal credit, but at the moment, the interest rate has been higher because their market for credit has been smaller. So, so, so in a way, yes, you provide good thing, but also for the weak uh, 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 UKM, you actually making them even get a bigger problem because they were trapped with a much bigger interest rate from this informal lender. So, so my question is that why, uh, what is it actually you also do to avoid those situation? So for example, I give an example, a case of Gojek. Yeah. Yes, Gojek also doing those kind of thing. But one thing is that why Gojek do is allowing those who are not in Gojek to become a Gojek driver relatively easy. Now, so all you're doing, I haven't seen this part. What are you dealing, what are you doing with this informal creditor? You cannot just ignore them. They're quite big yeah? and they could create a situation that is negative. Yeah. So that is my uh, question, first question. Second question is related to this uh, money, uh, electronic money. So I actually uh, need more explanation exactly where is the productivity coming from? You know, I can understand when you provide investment, then the productivity coming from those investment, higher investment. So then uh, you could produce more. Uh, then you are um, um, actually uh, becoming more productive. But changing uh, physical money into digital money, exactly where the productivity coming from is a bit difficult to understand. So when you're campaigning that you have been successful in terms of implementing this uh, electronic money, uh, it, I do have a, a, a problem in understand what exactly the productivity that you are creating. No, maybe, yes, probably, yes, there is, but spelling out those uh, productivity, where the productivity coming from, is actually uh, good to show that they're our contribution. Yeah, because changing the physical into electronic is not yet any contribution over there. Thank you. Thank you, Mas Budi. Oh, well, that was um, okay. And I probably would invite uh, Pak Amir first to answer some of the questions. Silakan, Pak Amir. Thank you. Um, if I recall correctly, Pak Peter uh, asked about the amount as well as the sectors. In 2019, uh, we did in total about 2.4 trillion. In 2020, we did about 3.3 trillion. And this year, we are aiming higher than that. Uh, the thing is, 
the distributions of the monthly installments skewed towards the second half. So it's more like double. So it's about 30% of our volume, mostly in the first half, 70% uh, in the second half. Uh, it is partly related to the way the government spending. So the gov a lot of our customers are related to the government and the government spending really picked up in second half, especially in the Q4. So we, we have typically a very high volume in the Q4. So right now, probably we are dispersing about 100 to 200 billion. So it will uh, double towards the second half. Secondly, on the sectors, uh, before COVID, uh, about 20% of the sectors that we serve are in the creative industry. Creative meaning like the one who organized events, so event organizers, uh, uh, digital or video productions for brands, or they do help the digital marketing for brands. Uh, but unfortunately, since the COVID area, uh, events, events are not happening. Uh, physical events are completely wiped off, basically. Uh, we have uh, now pivot our, uh, I think somehow we have a lot of uh, sectors related to health. So those providing uh, APD, uh, you know, health protection masks. Uh, I think we also see a lot of FMCG. So the, the brands that are producing food. And third is uh, logistics and uh, telcos related uh, sectors. Uh, those are still growing sectors uh, in the COVID. Uh, that's where also our focus has been. So I think that's, that's uh, Peter. I truly apologize. The second question I sort of missed, is there anything in my part that I need to answer with? Uh, no, I think um, the, the general question from Masbudi is for everybody, I think. Okay. I think the question from Masbudi is, uh, is a very good question and critical question, which is hard to answer. Uh, what what I like to, to say uh, is that this Tengkulak, which is the shadow banking, if you like to say, a shadow economy, has been existing for many, many years since we know the time and unregulated. In fact, I think uh, I would like to see the way and the existence or the emergence of fintech lending is actually is a good thing because it brings out whatever which is in the shadow to comes into limelight and that way we are actually when we started out five years ago we like to be regulated with our JK. we engaged them, please regulate us so that somebody is just watching this industry so for whoever providing you know so i would say probably uh we are some some of the players we are not we are in sme some of the individuals loans are providing a pretty high rate uh, but at least everything is now above board. And that way, there is an association, there's a regulation that comes and regulate that. And the tax, government can impose tax, or ask us to collect tax. Right now, whatever under the shadows in this Tengkulak life is unregulated, has been existed and very difficult to regulate, right? So I like to say from that, that point, so, the issue, if I may call adverse selections or crowding out for those who are really, really bottom and cannot afford things, right? I think this is, is a very systemic problem that uh, beyond our industry. So as an industry, we try to do something, but I think it's also uh, a lot of hope that should be pinned also on the government how to do and help really, really those in the bottom of the, of the pyramids. Because at the end of the day, I suppose we are a commercial ventures, a commercial ventures that I think it's easy to lend money, but very difficult to collect money, right? So, and we are, we are trying to see, and it is an only natural for a financial institution or financial ventures to go into the more prime of the customers rather than the less prime of the customers because the likelihood to default is lower. So I think 
is an economic question uh, that needs to be answered. I completely agree with those people who are less fortunate than us, hands to mouth are very difficult. They need to be able to access as well. Probably it's a process, a process whereby now it's very early. The maturity of the industry is very young. It's only five years, right? And it's still very developing. So hopefully that will, uh, you know, one way or another, whether there's a cost of actions or regulations by regulators or by government, and enhance and help them. And there's some positive action as well, probably some of the uh, more philanthropic or aid that can also help them. Uh, that's, I think, uh, my comments and two and a half cents. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Amir. Uh, Sarah, silakan. Thank you very much. So um, uh, thank you for the question. So first of all, pa Peter, uh, the question is, of last year, we, um, we impacted 200,000, over 200,000 people. Uh, we are still mainly in Java, but we, uh, as I mentioned, there's also areas like in Bali, Nusa Tenggara, as well as um, Sulawesi. Um, and that includes the pedesaan. So it's not a plan. We're already doing it. We're doing it in very, very remote areas, even with, uh, with barely any electricity or internet but we were able to make it work. Um, so that was uh, for Pat Peter. Uh, and for Sarah, um, how to get the baseline information. We truly believe in collaborations. And so we're a FinTech payment company. We ensure that payment gets to who our clients want to pay to, but we don't necessarily, uh, but we're not the ones who determine where it needs to go. Like you go to bank, you know who you want to pay to, and then the bank just ensures that it gets to the right person. So that's kind of like our function is our clients already know exactly who they want to pay to, and then we ensure that they get paid. So the clients are the ones who are actually putting the baseline information, including the face, um, and, uh, and then so they would provide us with that information that goes into our system. So then by the time um, the redemption or the payment is done, the distribution is done, uh, all they have to do is just like, uh, just show their face and that's it. Sorry, Sarah. So mm -hmm. if it was me, can my picture mm -hmm. goes to different clients? Uh, yeah, so basically the accounts we make belong to the person who actually owns the account, whomever that may be. So um, it, if they're already in there and then there's, for example, there's a disaster or and then there are several programs going around, if uh, it is possible for them to receive from several, or if it's a different time, like uh, we have like Zakat Fitrah, and we had um, one where it was uh, actually for, for COVID, that they would also be eligible for that. So uh, we ensure that it's safe, that it's in, in accordance to what would benefit um, the, the account holders. Um, so yeah, and then number three, um, the question, I guess, is like, where's the, um, where's the value that we provide? Uh, one is that by creating this ecosystem, we actually bring real value in, in terms of, uh, we increased sales of these small stores. We, um, and then also the beneficiaries, instead of having to be in a crowded area and trying to get aid or having to wait for a day, all they have to do is just shop. So it's very real and very tangible benefits that everyone who works with us actually get from. They get a benefit, every single person. And then the other thing is that you mentioned, like, what's the difference? Like, you're just changing cash to, to uh, cashless. So what's the value in that? Probably for you, it doesn't matter. But you can, can you imagine if you are in a village and then you're only... Your only source of funds is uh, the only way you could receive funds is through cash. It means that the person who is paying you must be in physical proximity to you. So they would only be able to sell to people who are within that village. If that village is all poor or there's only one tangkulak that is willing to pay only 10% of the market price, that's all you've got. You do not have any choice. Or let's say if you are a brilliant coder 
and you're stuck in a village somewhere, you've, you've, uh, uh, you've learned by yourself how to code, that knowledge and that skill will forever be a hobby. It can never become a career because they will never be able to receive payments for the services they render. And so by changing physical money into digital money, you suddenly unlock the financial access and capabilities of these people. And especially in a country where there's 17,000 islands, it's crazy the opportunities that it brings. You have, I don't know, a, a produce that it sells very, very well somewhere else. But then if you can only sell it to one person in your village, compared to if suddenly your, your market opens and you can receive digital payments from others, then the value that that person would receive and the creation of value to the entire econ uh, economic ecosystem is huge. So that is the value that we bring. Thank you, Sarah. And I think uh, we, I'm going to invite Leon to address the last question about the source of funding. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there are two, uh, I would like to comment first actually on Babudi uh, question about the productivity, right, of digital finance, because we are actually the one applying offline or the usual cash-based transaction. So, for example, a member has to come at a time to our office to repay the loan. It's going to take them probably go back and forth one and a half hours, and that, that's taking away their time from, have, from doing their business. And also they have to pay either for fuel for their motorcycle, or they have to go using Angkot or the public transport, and that's gonna cost them like 30,000, for example. So that's a lot. If, it, if they can just go to their next uh, warung, uh, who has like with happy or anything, they can just transfer to us. Uh, that's one and a half hours and uh, 30,000, probably, uh, I don't know the commission uh, for the transaction, probably 5,000, 2,000, and that's it. So that's a lot of, increased like uh, a big savings in productivity and cost. So this for Pabudi. Uh, first, the second one is about the Tangkulak yeah, or loan shark. We, we, met, we met with them. They don't like us because we were taking away the Indian market. To share with you, we were scared when we first started that Tangkulak will not like us and I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll do some bad things to me probably or my team. But what happened is that we found that most Tangkulak or Loan Shark, they are individuals who have money. They are not big Mavia institutions. So what happening is with the emergence of microfinance institutions and peer-to-peer -peer lending, what happens is it's taking away market from them. And uh, does that necessarily mean they will say, oh, my market shrink by 90%. So we are gonna charge more to those who left, who, to those who cannot afford those formal institutions. In our experience, it's not like that. Their pricing is quite fixed. So the pricing for a loan shark is 30% per month. So 360% per year. Well, some also charge 10% per day. There's peer-to-peer lending, which also apply that rate, by the way. <laughs> Definitely not investory, but some, some, some other institutions. So, it's uh, not that bad of a, a outlook, so to say. Actually, it's taking more and more the market out of the informal sector, which is very expensive. By the way, they are very expensive in an understandable manner because Loan Shark in general will collect the repayment on a daily basis. So it's a very, very high touch basis. And also from the service point of view, it's really fast. You can take the loan, for example, you need money, you just call, hey, I need loan, and then the, the loan officer will come on the same day. That's why having peer-to-peer, -peer, which is even faster, uh, would cut this sort of, sort to say, the inefficient uh, supply chain of funding. So that's from our experience. Uh, that's to answer Pabudi, to comment on Pabudi's question. And to answer uh, Mr. Peter's uh, question, my colleague Ferry uh, have done the numbers. Fer, please kindly share. Yeah, uh, Pak Peter, I will try to answer your question. So um, our asset, uh, KKI's asset by the end of uh, 2020 is around uh, 1.4 million US dollars. And our current main source of fund is from third-party loan. 
uh, which comprise about 53% of our funds. Um, this third party loan mostly comes from individual lenders uh, without collateral. Uh, and in, it's uh, in the amount of 50 million rupiah or it's multiple. Uh, the rest uh, of our fund comes from a member's savings. Uh, it's about 25%. 14% uh, comes from the nation, uh, and the other 8% comes from the other sources. Uh, I hope this answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I apologize to everyone. Um, with this, we conclude today's seminar. Please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers. We certainly learned a lot today. Um, this all three have different business models, but they all have one thing in common, that is to empower those with less. And I'm handing this over to Achonel to announce the next events and um, to close the seminar, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Nuka, and thanks again for all the speakers and participants uh, for this uh, webinar. We will have a joint uh, online event with uh, Universitas Gajah Mada on 15th of April, so that's two weeks from now, but on Thursday, and that is Mubiarto Public Policy Forum, and the topic is uh, COVID-19, agriculture, and rural development, and the speakers will be Chris Manning from NU, Chatur Sugianto from UGM, and also uh, Tessa Napitupul from World Resources uh, Institute Indonesia. So I hope... Uh, you can also join us and on 15th of April. So again, thank you so much. And we will close the session now and we hope to see you again in the next uh, event. Thank you. 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 Thank